Just Books Podcast Episode 3, The Misconception. Hello and a warm welcome to this, the third full episode of my podcast, Just Books. Last week I introduced you to poor, little rich girl Daisy, the only child of a wealthy ex-London gangster who had emigrated to the paradise playground Marbella on the Costa del Sol. It was known as the Costa del Crime in the British tabloid press in the 70s. The novel is called Daisy's Chain, a story of love, intrigue, and the underworld on the Costa del Sol, and is part of the Costa del Sol collection. By me, Owen Jones. This week, I'm going to introduce you to Megan, a 12-year-old girl who lives in Phaeton, which sounds remarkably like Barry in the Vale of Glamorgan, South Wales, where I grew up. Megan is a budding psychic, but she doesn't know anyone else who is. She can't discuss why she can see lights and aura around people, or why she knows a large tiger that no one else can see. Imagine how weird that must be for a 12-year-old. In fact, she had tried to talk to her mother, Suzanne, about it several times, but she became angry and locked her in the coal cellar each time. Still, she is not completely abandoned. She has Gur, the ghost tiger, Watson Hinsha, her spirit guide, and Gramps, her maternal grandfather, who had passed away around the time of her birth. At the time of writing, the misconception, a spirit guide, a ghost tiger, and one scary mother, exists in 40 languages. There is a huge backstory to why I wrote this novel and the series, but I have limited space in each podcast, so I will keep those details for a subscriber's only podcast. If you want to know, just subscribe. It is free. It will also mean that you don't ever miss the weekly episodes. Suffice it to say that my father was a spiritualist, medium, and healer, and so were others in his immediate family. My mother knew that that way of life was true. She could see auras, but it went much deeper for her. Deeper and darker, Minnie would say. She told me all the time that I knew her, that she was a white witch. My father believed that she was a very powerful woman, too. He stories that he told me would make you sit up in awe or disbelief. You could actually call this a true story, but it is an amalgamation of my mother's experiences and mine. Anyway, you know what to do if you want this to hear more. A spirit guide, a ghost tiger, and one scary mother. One. Description from the book cover. The Psychic Megan series consists of 24 novelettes about a young girl's growing realization that she is able to do things that none of her family can. Megan is 12 years old in the first volume. She has two seemingly insurmountable problems. Her mother is frightened of her daughter's latent abilities and not only will not help, Herbert actively discourages her, and she can't find a teacher to help her develop her supernatural psychic powers. For she wants not only to know what it is possible to do and how to do it, but to what end she should put her special abilities. Megan is a good girl, so it would seem obvious that she would tend towards using her powers for good, but it is not always easy to do the right thing, even if you know what that is. These stories about Megan will appeal to anyone who has an interest in psychic powers, the supernatural and the paranormal, and is between the ages of 10 and 100 years old. In the misconception, Megan is 12 years old, and her mother has locked her in the coal cellar again for talking about her psychic powers. Telling lies, as her mother calls it. She's frightened of the spider she cannot see. But her friend a huge ghost Siberian tiger, comes to give her moral support as she contemplates her future and her deceased grandfather takes her on an outing to the sea by astral travel. 2. Reviews from Amazon A. I love to listen to these books with my tween goddaughter because it opens a path of communication, especially questions. We both enjoyed this book and she actually understood the message behind the story. 
B. Megan's backstory is interesting, and we learn why her mother is so strict and strange. Luckily, Megan has a loving father who accepts her gift, believing it to be only her imagination. I was fascinated by this girl's ability to see the auras of the people around her, and she could also detect an illness in an elderly woman. Megan does not appear to be strange. She just has a unique perspective. She is likable and fairly typically for her age. A great novel for the new teen. The coming of age and seeking to find an understanding of her new powers leads to young Megan looking for the right answers but in the wrong places. Is the best teacher a dead teacher? You'll have to read it to find out. 3. Sample from the book. The Misconception, A Spirit Guide, A Ghost Tiger, and One Scary Mother. By Owen Jones. 1. Hobson's Choice. Megan was locked in the coal cellar again on the verge of tears. She was only 12 and she couldn't understand why her mother would do such an awful thing to her. It had happened half a dozen times before, but like as not, she thought, her father didn't know anything about it. She had never told him, and she was sure that her mother would never have said anything either. There was an unspoken pact between her and her mother not to let each other down, but here she was again, sitting in the cellar, in the dirt and dust, with who knew what horrible creatures eyeing her up. She didn't know. It was pitch black, and it took all her strength to keep herself from crying and begging her mother to let her out. But she had tried that on other occasions, and her mother had put unreasonable demands on her as conditions for her release. Conditions she knew she could not fulfill, try as hard as she might. Sometimes it seemed that she was the only one who took the pact seriously. Despite herself, tears began to roll down her cheeks again, making invisible riverbeds through the dust on her face, washing coal dust onto her school uniform. It was too much. It really was. How could someone who understood her so well behave so cruelly towards her only daughter? Megan jumped involuntarily as her mother willfully hit the door with the vacuum cleaner as she passed by. There was not even the slickest sliver of light from which to draw comfort. So she did what she had found helped her the most and scrambled up the coal heap to the wall and then to her right until she, she wrapped her long skirt around her legs to stop anything creeping up under her clothes and tucked it underneath her. She did up all the buttons on her blouse, pulled her socks up, pulled her sweater over her head, and retracted her hands inside her sleeves. This, Megan knew, was as safe as it got from whatever lived in the coal cellar. She was not worried about ghosts and things like that, although that was the problem, really, but she didn't like insects crawling over her and couldn't bear the thought of being bitten and having her blood sucked out. She hated spiders, too, but wrapped in the cocoon of her school uniform, she knew that there were, at most, a few inches of skin above her socks that the creepy crawlies could get to. A few square inches to the sides, to be precise, because her arms hugged her calves tight to her thighs. She wished she could stop sobbing, even just for a while, but she knew that she would eventually, as she waited to be released. She knew when that would be, too, at about 5.30, giving her half an hour to get cleaned up before her father came home from work. Megan understood why her mother was doing this. It was because she was afraid, and Megan wasn't. Her mother was frightened for her daughter, and so wanted to make her frightened like she was. The problem was that Megan was not frightened, and could see nothing to be frightened about. She had tried to explain it a hundred times to her mother, but... She just shut her up, either figuratively or literally, like now. Her parents were both Catholic, but her mother was a very strict Catholic and her father somewhat less so. Her mother was frightened about the afterlife, so she said, but not for herself, since she considered herself to be a good Catholic and was convinced that her place in heaven was already assured, so long as she continued to do her duty. The problem, as far as Megan was concerned, was that her mother thought that part of her duty 
was to lock her daughter in the coal cellar, which was why she was there now. Her father had also been born a Catholic, but was not as strict as her mother. He believed that if people wanted to risk eternal damnation, then that was up to them. He cared about his own soul, and those of the ones he loved, but he believed in an amount of free choice, even for little girls. Megan loved both her parents, despite what her mother did to her, because, although she was only young, she realized that her mother had her best interests at heart. She even tried to love them both equally, but the problem, in Megan's opinion, was that her mother had either not had good teachers or had been too frightened to believe her own eyes, ears, or senses. She wasn't quite sure what they were. She just knew that she had them, and so did others. But that her mother did not admit to them, and so her mother did not want to believe that others had them either. After all, her mother had told her, I am thirty-four, and you are only twelve. I studied at a Catholic school, whereas you just go to the interdenominational comprehensive school. Her mother had apparently not had any issues with the comprehensive schooling system, but she had spat out the word interdenominational. Megan had never understood the problem. She had met both good and bad, clever and not so, and aware and not so, from most religions. Her mother fell into the good at heart, clever and quite aware categories. Her father was good, clever, and fairly aware. Megan judged herself to be good, reasonably clever, and very aware. That was her problem. That was why she was huddled in the corner of a jet-black coal hole, with all sorts of things probably crawling all over her right at this very second. She shuddered at the thought, but the snivelling had stopped now, as she had known that it eventually would. She knew that she had two options. She could tell her father what was happening to her behind his back and cause a row, which might lead to divorce or her being taken into care, or she could pretend that she was not aware, as she normally referred to it. Megan had learned that the best thing to do when she was locked in the cellar was to think about something else, and the subject that she liked to think about the most was her friends. She did not have many friends, but they were special to her. Her favorite friends were her grandfather, Watin Hinsha, and her pet cat. She closed her eyes, tried to relax, and tried to picture them standing before her, or sitting beside her. This always gave her a warm feeling, and so she did it whenever she was upset. It was one of her little tricks for coping when life seemed unfair. Megan thought she felt something brush up against her thigh, and heard a low noise that was muffled by her sweater. She froze for a moment. This is a clip from the um, audio book that we had made before. I hope you enjoy it. Nobody thought about Megan, though. But then, nobody but Suzanne knew that she was being locked in the cellar, either. Not even Mrs James knew that much. The reason why she was locked up this time was because Megan had heard from one of her school friends, who lived a few doors up the street, that they had been burgled the day before. Apparently, two men, and probably a small boy, had stolen all their valuables while Mrs Smith was out shopping. It seemed that two brush salesmen had been ringing the front doorbell, and that the door had opened and they had gone in. A neighbour across the road had testified to having seen the men being invited in. However, upon questioning, the neighbour could not swear to having actually seen who opened the door, but the men had removed their hats and entered respectfully. The police had worked out that after ringing the bell a few times, they had phoned a boy accomplice who was waiting round the back to climb in through a fanlight window and open the front door while keeping out of sight. When they were finished, the boy probably let them out and then left by the back door into the lane. In fact, the gang were fairly well known to the police all around the country and there was now a warning on Crime Watch on TV. The public was shown various disguises that the men frequently used in their contracts. It was thought that the team had already left the area, but they said that they could be active again within a month or two. The brush salesman that Suzanne had allowed into their house was the spitting image of one of the gang. Five. 
Links. The Misconception, along with all my other books, is available from most bookshops, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play Books, Kobo, Tech Time, and Zingzi, and my blog, Megan Publishing Services. Six. Thanks. Thank you for listening to my podcast. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please subscribe, free of charge, using the button below, in order to be alerted when other episodes are released, which will be about once a week. If the misconception seems to be right up your alley, please use the links above to find out more or buy the book. I'd love to hear from you, and especially what you think of the story. Until next time, Owen.